London. Are you, like, I am absolutely jacked the fact that we're back in London, man. How awesome is that? Yeah, is this uh, one of the more exciting moments of your career? Being in London, like, uh, it's a toss-up between the last-minute submission against Ankalaev and the arm break. What do you think's better? Man, well, if they're both aging, much better, both of those wins I know, every exactly. Day. We've got two of the top 205ers <laughs> moving their way up the division. And there's a pure, poor UK guy kind of just sitting in the outskirts. Feel sorry for me. <laughs> does, does that give you more confidence, though, seeing what Ankalaev, seeing what Jamal Hill are doing in some of these recent performances and where they're kind of sitting in the rankings? Definitely. One of the things that you always do is compare yourself to other guys in the division. And you want to know that you fit there. Because that's what it's about, and it's about, am I good enough to be in that top 10? Seeing what Jamal Hill done in his last two fights gives me confidence, and seeing what Anka Live's doing to the top prospects in the top 10, so it's just filling me with hope. Yeah, definitely, and you come in against someone like Nikki Kirilov, who has a lot of experience as well, um, what do you just think of this matchup, what does this do for your career? Definitely, like, breaking into the top 10 has been a goal for me for the last two years, we had COVID, which set that kind of on the back burner you know it was about getting fights so for the for my new year new resolution all this kind of nonsense it was getting into that top 10 and there's one guy standing in my way at the moment and it's Krylov so what I'm looking to do is put on a performance of the night not to get the bonuses but to get my name in the mix for this top 10 top 5 be a title contender because going 15 minutes and taking damage and putting on a performance are two different things. Going to 15 minutes, people can get a wee bit bored of that. They don't really want to see decisions. They want to see knockouts. They want to see submissions. So it's about putting on a performance for me, and it's going hell for leather. It's about looking for these submissions, looking for the finishes, and not playing it safe. And we see that quite a lot of fighters do that. Quite a lot of fighters will just play safe and get the victory at the end. That's not what I want. What I want is I want performances of the night. I want to be remembered for putting on performances, entertaining fans, fans to be like, Paul Craig, ah, he's not the best, but by God, does he put on a performance. Yeah, and you look at the ingredients here, I mean, 42 wins between the two of you. I think there's only one decision, and that's on his side. Yep. So when you go in there, um, do you meet fire with fire, or do you have to be cautious in the early going to make sure you don't walk into something or make a big mistake? You know, you always need to be switched on. You don't want to go fire for fire. But I think this fight deserves fire for fire. I think it needs to be blood, sweat, tears, snot as the full shebang. I think that's what it needs. And especially a fight with two of the top 10, 205ers, and we're on the early prelims. I think that's a, like, the fans who are watching the prelims are going to enjoy this fight to kick off the, the prelims with, as opposed to waiting to the main event. The fight's already done. We'll be out having a few beers. We'll be away to the dancing. We'll be celebrating. And we know he is, uh, you know, has ties to Ukraine, and there's a lot going on there. And we haven't had the chance to speak to him, so we don't know exactly where he's at mentally. But um, what do you kind of just make of what maybe he's enduring, you know, personally and on that side of it going into this fight? Yeah, he's a professional, and I'd love to say that it's not going to affect him, but he's dealing with something bigger than UFC, than a fight of a top ten. He's he's his real fight is much bigger than the UFC. Thank you, Paul. Paul. I saw you, you and Nikita, like eating breakfast, like right next to each other yesterday. Yeah, I didn't even know what was in behind me. Yeah, it was like you guys were like back to back, I, right? Like, so I turned around, and you know that way you kind of notice someday, it didn't look that big. No, like you know when I, you look at people and you're like, "Whoa, he's he's a bit of a man, isn't he?" I looked at him and I went, "His neck's a wee bit in the thin side." <laughs> He, you obviously have a lot, like an incredibly high level grappling. You talked about like when you broke Jamal's arm. Uh, he has a ton of submissions too. So how would you compare your MMA grappling to his MMA grappling? Yeah, that's that's what makes this fight exciting. Um, I'm a grappler. He's a grappler. Where our struggle is against guys who are power punchers, guys whose skill isn't that high, but they've just got this one knockout punch power. I like to go in a wee bit gung ho. You know, hands are down. I'm trying to grab one. I'm trying to pull guard. He's very good at grappling, and we're going to see who is the best grappling in 205 because I don't think of MD else who really comes close to myself and Krylov maybe Clover maybe that's the next fight you Anthony know. Smith is pretty good too right do you think so I watched this triangle okay. against uh, the wrestler what was mm -hmm. it the guy basically run into his legs and was like I go and, go and put me in that triangle <laughs> whereas at least I look like I'm actually trying to work for the triangle um, but you know what's really good the fact that one of the best grapplers in the division is a Scottish guy no Brazilian 
Um, and I don't know if you know this, actually, like, see the actual uh, family tree of Gracie, it's actually from Scotland. Interesting fact. Do you know that? You must not. I know. Hey, I'm a direct relative of every famous Scottish guy. See, <laughs> see, what, see William Wallace? His blood courses through mine. Uh, finally, I know you just mentioned him, Glover. What do you make of that title fight between your Prohaska and Glover to share coming up in June? It's the old dog versus a young bull in it. It's like we've got somebody in uh, Glover who's seen it, done it. Uh, he's been just like chiseling away trying to get that title, and now he's got it. And I think it's going to be a lot harder for Yari than a lot of people think. I think he's just. I think they expect him just to go in, do a crazy bit of spinning shit, and it's game over. That's not going to happen. Glover's too old and too wise for that. Like you watched him. Like one of the standout moments for me was when Glover's tooth got knocked out with that uppercut for Gustafsson. That's amazing, man. That's tough as shit. But then what he does is then he returns that favour and knocks the teeth out of Anthony Smith. There you go, the dentists. Paul, just uh, down here. How you doing, my friend? I'm fine, how are you? Yeah, I'm living the dream. You know, it's fight week uh, and there's fans. Like, I can't get any better than that. For the last, what, two years we've had no fans. Entertainment, it's, an, it's a sport of entertainment. And for the last two years, you've been the fans have been watching it without any people there, so... I'm over the moon to be here. So I just want to say I'm really happy that you've kind of changed your mind and reconsidered your retirement plans. Yeah. Um, because let's face it, in your division, a couple of great wins and you're up there for a title shot, right? Um, and if you do win the title, you would become the first Scottish UFC champion. Yep. How much would that mean to you? That that means so much more to me than like anything else. Like Getting the belts is like, amazing, but I want to be the first of the Scottish. I want people to... Like, you know, when you're in school and you have to research somebody and somebody's like, I'm going to check Scottish athletes and I come up and then people then start researching about me and then they're going up in front of their class and telling people, oh, I'm, I'm doing my presentation on uh, the Paul Bildu Craig. You know, he was the first Scottish champion. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I'm looking forward to, like to inspire the next generation of Scottish athletes or even the next UK athlete in the world of MMA for a long time. And this is like a kind of breakthrough event for the talent to be showcased for the UK fighters. And that's what we're seeing. Like for a long time there's only been like one or two guys and we're not getting the recognition we deserve. It's taking what uh, Leon Edwards up to this point, all the wins he's, he's racked up, fighting savage after savage for him to get a title shot. We're looking at Arnold Allen, the exact same thing. Scottish guys, UK guys don't really get the credit they deserve. And I think it's because we are on the other side of the world. MMA is still very, very early. Uh, in the, it's, it's very early days for the sport in the UK comparing it to America so that's why the Americans get more opportunities but this is a breakthrough event for this to all change to see people like Molly Meatball McCann to see people like Tom Aspinall just rise so I'm excited to see what um, the UK can do within the next couple of years of the sport since you've uh, touched on that, I was going to say, like, you're not a decisions guy, you're a finished guy. Yep. And like you've just said there, it just feels like you're not, it, for me anyway, personally, I feel like you're not getting the recognition you deserve. And some of those guys that you mentioned also are not getting the recognition you deserve. So having said that, how do you stop yourself from not feeling demotiv demotivated by that? Yep. How do you keep going? Last year was, it was horrible for me. I get the victory over Jamal Hill sensational you know it was viral i think it was a there was that night i was told it was the most searched thing and uh, the world at that point was paul craig arm break and the second most searched thing was what language does paul craig speak they were the two like, <laughs> to me that that's that's amazing but after that after the dust cleared and everything settled then there was nothing for paul and it was like right paul there's gus and I wasn't allowed to tell people because the fight was never, ever announced. And then that fight was then pulled from me. And then we were going to fight at round about, I think it was the 18th of December against Krylov in Las Vegas. Then the US put ban on people coming into the country who weren't double vaccinated. So that that year was like, I was dragging my heels. And I, like, if you had said to me about the retirement thing, then I was like, ah, you know, it's what do I need to do? Because I thought, you think about my, the guys who they put me up against, like unbeaten ranked guys who were like um, Ankh Alive when he first came in, they were tipping for the be the next big thing, and then they're throwing me to him. And then you had uh, Jimmy Crute, the exact same thing, Jamal Hill. So these guys, like I'm going up against like, some of the, the unbeaten prospects in the division and I'm not getting any recognition. This fight, 
it's definitely going to give me some recognition. And just finally for me, Paul, um, you mentioned recently that there are two things that can change a man's mind. A woman, the smell of gold. Mm -hmm. I want to know, what about the smell of haggis? Oh, have you, have you smelled haggis? Uh, I think I might be fortunate enough to not have No, like, so for anybody that doesn't know what haggis is, it's basically rather than throwing all the, 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 the non-selected meats like, you know, your... Uh, prime rumps, all this kind of stuff, what we do is we just grind all that up, add a wee bit of oats, fire it into some sheep bladder and then we eat it. I know you're thinking like that's pretty bonkers, but then so's eating black pudding, that's that's even worse. So the smell of haggis isn't as nicest, but what we what we try and do to make it a wee bit better is we fire loads of spices and loads of herbs and it tastes slightly better. But as you say about the two things that can change a man's mind, we all know a good partner can make you change your mind. And in that and my partner said to me she was like do you genuinely believe you can walk away from this sport and not do what you set your heart on doing? And the answer is, no, I can't. I, I, I believe I've still got a wee bit of mustard left in me, you know, that ketchup bottle or that mustard bottle, there's that wee tiny bit at the bottom and you're not going to buy a new one because <laughs> mustard doesn't get used that much. You put water in it. You want to get it out, so that's, <laughs> that's um, I've still got a wee tiny bit left in me, so I'm going to, this is the last push. And if I can't do it on Saturday night, if I cannot beat Krylov and I can't stop him, then I shouldn't be in the UFC, I shouldn't be in the top 10. And then it's a case of, if I want to do this again, then I need to restart the whole th process again. I've not got time, I'm 34, I'm losing my hair, I've got grey in my beard and my balls. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck on Saturday night, Paul. Paul, Thank you very um, much, a lot of talk about... Oh, we sorry, oh you're there, sorry, man. <laughs> a lot of talk about the, the golden era of UK MMA. And obviously the fan base is very stimulated at the UFC London, but have you thought about what happens if it does turn out to be a huge win streak for the UK? Uh, Scotland will have huge wins, Wales will have huge wins, Birmingham, Liverpool, Wigan, Ipswich. I mean, we could be leaving this event with a whole new intensity to the fan base. Do you, do you believe that can happen with this cast of fighters? 100%. Well, I tell you, I, I, I'm going to tell you, you know, I don't care. What's worst they can do? They've booked various events around the UK this summer. They have booked places like Liverpool, Manchester, Glasgow, London. They've booked them. And it all depends on what happens on Saturday night, what we're going to get. So there is going to be another UK. There's going to be a huge show for UK fighters again. So it's going to be a regular thing. And I'm probably going to go out here and I'm probably going to get my, my knuckles wrapped. <laughs> hey, who cares? What's the worst I can do? Pull me for the show. <laughs> What would it mean to you to, to go back to Scotland? We've talked a lot about the, the round tree fight and, you yeah. know, it's something that you want to make right for a very long time. How, how, how much would that mean to you to get the opportunity to compete in Scotland again and I make know, that right? I feel like I, I didn't do my best. I didn't... I'd never gave the Scottish fans what they deserved. They deserved to see a prime Paul Craig going in there mentally focused, physically in the best condition I can be, going up against an opponent and getting the victory and getting a Paul Craig performance rather than what that fight was um, mentally, physically I wasn't there more mentally than physically you can do all the, the physical stuff in the gym you can lift weights, you can hit all your numbers you can go into the sparring sessions and win every sparring session but when it comes to that walk and if you're not in your head then you, you get what happens in, what happened to me in Glasgow lying on your back with, your, with the soles of your feet, everybody looking at them going up against a guy like Khalil, Khalil Roundtree, we've seen it at the weekend the guy is a savage, he's got power, he's got intensity, he's got, he's got something, he's got a bit of psycho about him, and he's, he's, he's a savage, so taking a loss for him, it's not a bad thing to, to receive, and it was a humbling experience, because I'd lost in Vegas, 209, and then I had then came to Glasgow, far too early, and they two losses, led me to London, led me to like the, the rebirth of Paul Craig, because I needed that, I got to the UFC, I was very, very green, very, very inexperienced, mentally, physically, emotionally, all the things that go along with that, I was, I was a kid. Day two losses made me a better athlete and then made me be able to dig deeper and know exactly what I was losing when it came to UFC, because I was going to lose that come London. I appreciate it, Paul. Nice. No worries. Paul, you're, I'm pretty sure in September you'll be unbeaten for three years now, winning four of your last five. What do you attribute the, the, good, run, the good run of form to? There's a whole host of things. You could say it's like it's down to one person, but it's not. It's like there's a whole team there. There's got my coach, Brian Gallagher, who's always doing the research, always trying to improve me in areas. So even if I'm not 
in a camp, I'm still trying to improve, I'm still trying to improve jiu-jitsu, I'm still learning in the sport of jiu-jitsu, he's improving my stand-up, I've, uh, I work with a sports psychologist as well, who is improving the mental side of things, because a lot of people underestimate that, underestimate that walk that we have to make, it's, it's, it's scary, first time I had to make that, everything, like, the the butterflies in my stomach and that was with no pressure. The second time I had to make that, there was more pressure because it was a main event or it was a main, opened up the main card for 209. There was a lot of pressure on me and that was consuming me. And then to go out in Glasgow and hear the love that the Scottish fans were giving me, it just, it was overwhelming. So now I'm able to control that through loads of different techniques like visualisation, um, like talking about stuff with him. So I've got that. One of the massive things as well was changing my conditioning, changing my nutrition, because it's a, it's, there's loads of cogs in the, the engine to keep this going, and that's what it was. So working way like Adam, to improve my conditioning, and rather than doing the stuff that you enjoy doing, you know when you enjoy going to the gym and you lift weights, and you're like, ah, this feels good. Let's add on more weight. Ah, I feel great. I'm feeling amazing. He's like, no, no, you're doing the, you're doing the maximal sprints 10 times. Mm -hmm. And I remember messaging him and being like, have you got this right? Because he kept just upping the number, and I was like, like, are you got this right? He's like, are you questioning me? Like, just do the hard work and get it done. So it's a whole host of things, but it's a it's crazy to think three years in this sport, I've been unbeaten, uh, and I'm still just chatting my way. What I'm looking for is another three years in this sport, unbeaten, with a belt around my waist, and um, retiring and being uh, leaving this sport as influential in the, the UFC. And obviously, you're now in a position where you could be fighting for a title in the near future, and you opened up on the loss uh, to kill Leo Roundtree in Glasgow. Once, like, did you ever ever envisage then that you could be in the position that you are in now? Because I know that obviously you, you've now retracted this. You did set a timeline that you said by the time yeah. of 35, I'm out. So, after in the fallout of that loss to Khalil, did you think that it'd be possible to be in contention after the loss to Khalil? So the, it was a whole thing that happened. Getting to the UFC was my goal. Mm. Like I had set my, st I had set the standard of I need to get to the UFC. Once I got there and I got the victory, I didn't reset goals. I didn't assess where I was going, and I was just fighting. I mean, you're just fighting. You've not fueled by in. You can. There's there's losses. There's things that happen to you. I was in like a bit of a self destruct mode there because you you doubt yourself. You doubt like. Many times I remember lying awake at night feeling like I don't deserve to be in the UFC. I felt like a fraud. And let's be honest, I was a fraud. I got beat off two high-level guys, but I was a fraud. I shouldn't have been there. And it made me work harder. It made me a better person. Um, so if you'd say to me back then, after the Khalil loss, do you think you'll be a title contender? Do you think you'll be in the top ten? I'd have probably told you no. I would have lied to you. It would be one of these things where I'd have said, oh, definitely, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be the world champion. But ultimately, in my heart of hearts, I probably wouldn't have believed it. So you look three years down the line for London, the last fight in London, and my life's totally changed. It's um, And it's changed for the better. It's changed better for my family, it's changed better for me, it's changed better for my team, and I'm inspiring the next uh, group of guys in my gym to be uh, UFC-level fighters. And another question I just wanted to ask, are you now fully training as a fighter? Are you no longer teaching at no. all? Um, you can give 50% to like, becoming a teacher or 50% to be an athlete, and the two of them can fail. You can be a really shitty teacher, and you're going to, the only people you're going to let down is kids, kids who are, like, who are dependent on you to, to mould them into the next, the next like, young adult they can be. Or you can be 50% in a fighter and be getting hurt and be getting kicked out of the UFC because you're not pulling your weight. So it, it only made one decision to be a full-time fighter and 100% focus on becoming the best I can be. Like, that was one of the things as well. Do you want to be Do you want to be remembered for the guy that could have been something or do you want to be remembered as a guy that was something? Mm -hmm. And I believe even now that I'm something. I'm, I'm something that's in the, within this sport. I'm a title contender. I've got a few records. Like... Right, I may be the second most submissions in the light heavyweight division, but I've still got, I'm still in these rankings. People look at that and be like, Paul Craig, oh, he was a guy with the beard and the crazy triangles of submissions and uh, the blue face paint. So, like, I'll always be remembered in this spot. Cheers, man. Thank you. Paul. Um, How you doing, my friend? Yeah, good, mate. How are you? Um, are you, are you, are you calling it? You're like, hey. 
We'd be done. <laughs> we've, we've got all day. Cheers. Um, so last time we spoke, you were really excited about obviously the, the gust of some fight. Was it was it difficult mentally to move on from thinking about Gus because you were very excited about that yeah. fight? Because uh, as much as Nikita is obviously an incredibly tough opponent, he doesn't have that the same name recognition as Gus. So was that was that tough mentally to to, to switch up opponents like that? It was because we done a full fight camp for Gus. We did a full fight camp that came here like maybe two weeks before we were meant to fly out to uh, Vegas and the fight was cancelled. And when that, it just feels like it should be ripped for you. And the UFC then phoned us up and said, listen, we know you deserve this fight, but do you want to wait or do you want us to uh, set you a new opponent? And we says, can we wait? Can we, can we just play this one out? Because we really want that. I remember he's the guy, the, f the cover of the game, like the computer game, it's him and it's John Jones and he's the top European guy, he's like... Ugh. So to pass that up and feel that slit him out of your hands, it's it, it's hard. But we don't get time in this sport to dwell and be like, oh, well, I'll just wait for another six months to see if Gus is going to be all right. And then it turns out he's not actually coming down to elite heavyweight. I think he's fighting, staying at heavyweight. Is he fighting Ben Rothwell? I think it is. So, like, we could have waited another six months for that fight and been, like, just sidelined for a whole year rather than the UFC said, listen, we know you deserve a big opponent. Would you be interested in fighting Krylov? Even though they've tried to set this fight up, like, three times prior to this. Like, we are happy for this fight. But if it's, like, a, a set of scales and who you want and who's the, who's the golden goose... And Gus has to be the golden goose, doesn't he? He's the guy who he's a he's a household name. And last one, um, last fight, you beat Jamal Hill, and then went out for a few drinks with him afterwards. And uh, you think you're going to go on the sesh with Nikita Krylov after this? Definitely. See if see if Nikita can keep up with. I think they, yeah. uh, he enjoys uh, uh, the, the the vodka as opposed to me. I enjoy the whiskey. So uh, maybe I'll get him drunk in whiskey. Maybe he'll get me drunk in uh, vodka. <laughs> but it's one of the things, you know. See, after business is done, when it comes to fighting, like fighting football, business is done. Let's go out and just celebrate, commiserate, whatever it is you want to do. And the vast majority of people I've fought against has been the same. I remember uh, in Australia getting beat off uh, Jamal, uh, no Jamal, it was uh, Jim Crute. And after he came up in a glass of wine and we shared like some stories, we shared how camp was, we shared all the kind of stuff that goes on. Because we're all, we're like-minded people. Like, in a different situation, we'd be friends. Like, if we were in the same gym, we'd be, we'd be mates because we're all working towards the same goal. So for me, just to celebrate with Jamal Hill, me celebrating him, commiserating, it's a great thing. But I love Jamal and I love his team because we still keep in touch. The guys are planning to come out to Scotland and they've been doing a bit of training. Um, Jamal Hill's mum messaged me and was thanking me for, like, um, it was cool. She messaged me and she's like, listen, Paul, I really want to thank you um, because you took Jamal to the next level. He was uh, emotionally immature, like the same as we all are. We need to feel that loss so that we know how much we want victory. If you don't if you don't know a loss, you can't fully enjoy victory. And she she showed me some love and I still messaged Jamal and like just want him to do the best because if he wins, it looks good on me. And the same as if uh, I win, it looks good in Jim Crook because they beat me. And if I win, it looks good in uh, Khalil Roundtree. All the people who beat me, it looks good in them. So I, uh, hopefully we can have a couple of share bits. Uh, I don't know how good his English is, but uh, we'll find out on Saturday night. Brilliant. Thanks so much, mate. Cheers. No, I appreciate it. Just one question uh, in terms of, here. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of, you, you mentioned how you used to you know, not be confident in terms of, you, you think you didn't deserve to be where you were. When did that change come across and when did you start being more sure of your ability and how did that affect just the way you fight? It was three years ago in London. Like, I can tell you the moment. I took 15 minutes of taking an absolute pace or it was like 14 minutes something. I, at that point, it was like resurrection. You had to feel the lowest point in your life and feel that you're losing everything, feel that you've let down your family, feel that you've let down your kids. Like My kids had to go into school on Monday morning and experience and, and have, my daughter's 15, and have young men, young, like her classmate, her peers, telling them that her dad lost, and that was a fuel for me, that was like, no, no, she, she doesn't deserve that, I chose to be an MMA fighter, she didn't choose me to be an MMA fighter, she shouldn't have to deal with my shit as well, so for me it was about, that was a, a motivating factor, and I remember him just dropping these heavy shots in my guard, I remember my neck being pressed up against the cage, and it was there, it was like, fire up a submission, what's the, la what's the worst that can happen? Rather than trying to fight out with my skill set, like, 
trying to be uh it's like trying to be uh a defender when you're a striker, it doesn't work. You've got to you've got to play your strengths. And for me, it was playing my strength of being a jiu-jitsu practitioner, and that's what I'm going to do, and that's what I've done for these last couple of fights. So it was that point there that I realised it was like the phoenix rising for the ashes. It was Fox, you know, he's coming through the ashes, and we're getting a brand new version of me, and that was it then. Thank you. We good. And that was because you'd said to him, they're like, no, <laughs> you're you're done. Hey guys, have a nice day.